pleasure to be here. Um, I have started my career as a, as a programmer um, back in the mainframe days. Um, and, and yet, as you're saying, never a better, never a better time to be um, in technology. Um, but I think our role in technology is changed, certainly over the duration of my career. And I think it creates an amazing opportunity for us to lead in a new way. So we're looking at a world that is very dominated by technology, where most of the things that we encounter every day are driven um, by the technology that each of us helps drive for our companies. We're looking at things where hyper-personalization, hyper-gratification has become the norm of what our consumers expect. And every experience they have becomes their expectation of us and our companies. So regardless of where that experience has come from, what industry it's come from, it now creates an expectation in how we actually provide them service. Jim talked to us about the fact that digitally mature companies are more profitable and they have higher turnover or revenue than their peer group. And so in a world where we look at exponential um, change and exponential opportunities that are created by technology, how do we as technologists actually help drive this revenue in, and margin within our businesses? And I think for most of us, it's creating a new opportunity to play, not only on the delivery of technology services, but actually in thinking through how do we actually look for those opportunities to drive profitability and margin, I mean profitability and, uh, and revenue. This is quite a lonely place when you get started, though. When we talk about, you know, we can increment our way, um, and that path is tried and true and feels quite comfortable to our management boards, feels very comfortable um, to the, you know, financial communities, feels very comfortable to the city and to Wall Street, uh, because they can predict where our companies are going next. But through Moore's Law and the doubling of, of capacity and the halving of cost, we're seeing that we can do things that were never possible before. And all of a sudden, we can have a much grander kind of breakthrough thinking around what's possible. The problem is, is that most of our counterparts and the other functions um, are good at their functional discipline. They might be great at marketing or supply chain. Um, they don't necessarily always feel as comfortable with the technology, and yet now technology is dominating everything they need to do. And I think what this does is open up you know, an opportunity for us in IT to actually start to, to not just provide the services, but actually start to lead. So that as we get on that exponential curve, we can actually help our companies through the disruption phase and actually lead um, in a brand new way. When I started in IT, I, IT was a cost center, and then we became an enabler, and then a business partner. But I actually think that the time is right for us and our teams to actually start to lead the business conversation, to start to look at how do we think through where the company needs to go next and how do we actually help in that way. Um, as CIOs, we you know, have adapted to what the I mean. So you know, 25 years ago, we were you know, the chief infrastructure officer and then became the chief integration officer and the chief information officer. And now I think we're really looking at ourselves as the chief innovation officers. And not only are we looking at ourselves that way, I think at least in the experiences I've had, you know, our business is craving for us to stand with them and help drive some of this because it is an uncomfortable position for them to be in when so much of the world that they've grown up in and, and the skills that they've used to be successful are now changing. And I'm seeing that more and more the partnership um, together, whether it's MarTech or FinTech, you know, it, it's really now coming together in terms of um, the role that they're expecting us to play. So what I thought I'd do is just share some um, examples of things that I've been uh, encountering. But really, then, after this slide, what I'd love to do is turn this more into more of a Q&A and think about the things that are on your mind and where are the ways that you can um, participate in a, in a more business-led um, kind of capacity. 
So we're seeing, if you've read the book Exponential Organizations, you're seeing this thing of a massive transformational purpose become um, really pervasive uh, within modern companies. This sense of purpose, whether it's you know, to solve the world's energy problems or create a smoke-free world, et cetera, those things are really easy for an organization as well as our customers and consumers to grab hold of. But it starts to massify whatever we're trying to achieve, and, and it's easy to, to bring people into that. And I think one of the things that we need to do um, as, as technologists is how do we create that sense of purpose within our organizations so that they can start to believe that we can you know, change the world in, in exponential ways. I think the biggest part for me recently is, is really spending much more of my time on how do we create new business models. So whether that could be um, something around um, social selling or um, marketplaces, et cetera, all of a sudden I'm finding over the last few years that I'm playing a m much more dominant role in thinking about new actual businesses we can go into, adjacencies, and when you start to look at things from a purpose-driven perspective, for example, if, if your company is, you know, Tesla talks about, you know, that it's here to solve the world's energy problems, and today it's using cars um, and what it's doing in that space, but it leaves itself open for a number of adjacencies and how do we start to think through those and actually start to recommend them and lead them within our business. Um, similar to what Jim was saying, I've changed all of the metrics that we, that we use within IT and it's really around how do the things that we're working on actually impact our financial statements. So are we contributing to revenue? Are we contributing to profitability? How do we handle free cash flow? And all of a sudden, when you start to measure yourself in those ways, you change what you work on. You change the focus of your teams. You change the bureaucracy that comes with some of the, you know, project governance and all of those things. And, and all of a sudden, those things become less important. And actually, how to get things done at speed so that we can actually um, get more of the return on investment become what we're talking about. Also, this whole concept of outside-in thinking, and one of the things that I love about opportunities where we come together as a, as a technology community is getting ideas from each other, and how do we actually share what each other are doing and how we might apply that. Um, and so the opportunity to be here today and, and be with you know, our peers is, is really part of this whole ability to help our companies find out what other companies are doing, things we might consider, um, and so, um, just yesterday I was talking to a bunch of our university graduate uh, students and talking to them about the power of networking um, and meeting with other people. And I think opportunities like today really help accelerate um, some of the ideas and some of the thinking that we have. I think the other thing that I've had to learn is pushing down decision making lower in the organization. If we want to impact financial results and drive better returns, um, we have to work at speed. And one of the things that we need to do in order to get that speed is to no longer be the person that has to make all the decisions. In fact, actually, when we allow decision making closer to the, to the area of, of impact, we see that we can get better decisions because people are more informed. And so I spend less of my time actually trying to make the decision and more of my time coaching others on how to make that same decision. And I think that's a big change, especially when we see lean, agile teams. Um, the makeup and the structure of those is about relinquishing control um, and allowing the team to, teams to be self-managed, self-governed. Um, and, you know, depending on the style that you've grown up with um, over the last, you know, couple of decades, it's, it's a change I think all of us as leaders need to be thinking about. I think the hardest thing that I've personally gone through um, as a leader is moving from, you know, failure is not an option to failure is an option. And I think if you've grown up with, um, I certainly grew up with the sense of, you know, high quality, has to work, you can't, um, you know, get things uh, into production that are going to fail and, and damage resiliency. All of a sudden, this concept of failure and that it's okay, I think has been a little bit difficult. Um, I do tell people they need to take intelligent risks, okay? We're not looking for a free-for-all and, and people to just, you know, try anything. Um, 
But again, you know, you need to think about your own organization and where are the pain points that you're having and how do we make new ways of, of working, new opportunities, because if we kind of squelch the, uh, the ingenuity and the innovation and the creativity that has to come with, you know, that failure is just a part of, uh, we won't actually reach the exponential um, types of results that we're looking for. But I think probably the biggest thing is about how do we drive culture. Um, I was uh, at a CEO forum last week, and uh, they wanted to talk about you know, the role of technology. And I said, three years ago, I used to talk about the tech. Because three years ago, the tech was brand new. Very few people were talking about black blockchain or AI or you know, the autonomous car. Those technologies are now viable. And if we're going to really get traction, what we need to do is, is change the culture and the mindset. Um, and I think also opening our minds to what's possible. This concept of creating a learning culture. So how do we ensure that we're spending enough time developing ourselves, that our teams are spending the time developing themselves? We talk about the shelf life of learning. Having moved from 1986 to 30 years was the average length of time you could uh, utilize anything that you'd learn, now down to five years. So how do we create a concept and a, and a culture of continuous learning? And more importantly, not only how do we learn, but how do we unlearn? Because so many of the things that we do today are actually um, using very different skills and mindsets than maybe what we were using just five years ago. So not only do we have to change ourselves if we want to really lead business, we also have to make sure that our teams are with us and that we're coming together. Um, in a consolidated way. So this collaboration, not only across the IT function, but also with um, our peers in other functions within the business, but more importantly, um, with people outside of our business, is becoming more and more, um, I think, a critical skill and something we need to, to really encourage. Um, I think in IT organizations, it can sometimes um, be very insular, and people are used to just working internally. Um, so how do we really encourage that and, and get to that speed because they're also learning from others? Um, Interfunctional or cross-functional teams, so we talked about the whole concept of, of agile development, really focused on the fact that you get subject matter, matter experts from a variety of different perspectives so that we can come up with the best solutions as quickly as possible. The sense of empowerment, so one of the things um, that I always do is, is immediately just stop taking the decisions and, and push that down lower within my organization. And at first, the whole team is so excited that uh, they get to now be the decision makers. Um, the downside of that is we have to make sure that they're ready to take that decision, and they now have to be accountable for the decisions that they make. So even at times where we think some of these things um, on the surface sound quite you know, empowering and motivating, um, all of a sudden, the team goes through this uh, aha moment of, oh, wait, now I have to be accountable for that. And how do we help and support them you know, as part of that journey? The other thing now is if we want you to be a business leader, if we want you to stand up in front of you know, your CEOs and your MDs or, or even maybe just a, a functional department head, um, how do we actually help our teams develop the confidence that they need? Um, I always tell people, when you don't have confidence, you just need a good dose of courage. And I think at times where people don't feel that they have the confidence, how do we help you know, them just go for it anyways and actually really um, just take that bold step? I have a favorite saying at the bottom of the screen. Um, I actually heard it once in a forum like this, and I don't remember the lady's name who said it. Uh, I wish I did, because I'd, I'd love to give her credit, because I use it all the time which is jump and, the net will, and trust that the net will appear. And how often do we hold ourselves back and we don't say something in that meeting or we don't say that idea because we think somebody will think it's too far-fetched? And the reality is if everyone in the room is agreeing with you, the idea is probably not bold enough. So how do we help not only ourselves, but more importantly, how do we grow a whole new generation of technologists who have the confidence to not only be at the table, as I tell my team, we don't, even, we don't just deserve a seat at the table, we are now the table. And if we aren't the ones driving our business, who in our business is more well-suited to do it? And so I think this, this kind of 
moving from the, you know, the basement uh, and, and now coming to, to the leadership roles that I think is expected out of this is a long gap for many people and how do we actually help to encourage that. I also think we have to get far more technically savvy um, than we've been in probably recent years. So I started um, my career as, a, I hate saying this, I started as a COBOL and CICS programmer. Um, most of my staff have not coded. Uh, they are not technical because over the last 15 years, this advent of, of large ERP deployments have meant that really we've outsourced most of our technical skills. And in a world where you want to be agile and quick, you can't have to go through contracting for every single piece of work you want to do. You need some in-house capability. And so how do we actually help uh, people redevelop um, you know, their technical skills uh, as part of that? We've talked already about uh, other industries and how can we learn? Um, how do we leverage different sets of talent pools? So they don't all have to work for us directly as companies. We can you know, uh, use a much more flexible approach in terms of, of how we actually gain talent. And, and that brings us you know, to the whole concept of ecosystems and that it's no longer just us, um, but it's actually how do we network with other companies? How do we know what's out there? Um, most recently, I had an example where I was with our, uh, one of the CEOs of, of one of our largest businesses, and we, he was talking about some new ideas, and I said, oh, well, I know this lady, and she's a Harvard PhD in economics. She speaks at the World Economic Forum. Um, she specializes in new business models, and she has a particular passion for Brazil. And um, I said, do you want to meet her? And he's like, absolutely. So the three of us met in New York and started to talk about new business models and, and things that, um, that we could do. And the point of that is it comes through knowing other people, knowing other companies, being able to connect the dots of you know, hearing something and, and then how could you actually take that to the next level. Um, and I think that we are you know, uh, together with, with probably finance in the best position because we have a holistic view of our business um, you know, we're not just specialized in marketing or we're not just specialized in, in uh, supply chain. We actually, um, through our roles in technology, get experience and exposure across the entire business. And I think that's one of the key things that we can bring to the table to actually start to join um, our counterparts in the other functions to, to new opportunities and new ways of thinking. So what I'd like to do there is, is kind of stop and, and really use the rest of the time to hear from you and the kind of questions that you have so that we can kind of tailor it. It's such a broad topic, but we can actually tailor it to what's of most interest. Can I give you a hand? Huh? Yes, give you yes, a hand? please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah.